Saxon Advanced Mathematics Lesson 65. You guys, if you didn't know it by now, we are so in the fast lane when it comes to our trig equations. We are doing so much complicated stuff. And today we're gonna bump it up again. Let me show you what the problem's gonna look like. We're supposed to solve this. What in the world did I just do? Oh, it's zero, I'm sorry. Given that, okay, that's a zero, not an X. I was thinking about that X and I got carried away. Okay, what is new here is what is with the radical sign in our trig equation. We don't know how to handle that. We've never seen that before. And this is a problem because we've got our variable is inside the pig house, if you will. So we can't allow that to stand. We can handle some radicals in trig equations. And the next example is going to show you one that's allowable. But this, no, we can't have this. There's too much. The function itself is inside the radical sign. So we're going to do exactly what we do in other kinds of problems. We're going to isolate the radical, which we did last year in a different kind of problem. And the way we'll do that is we'll add one minus sine squared x to both sides. That's where that zero becomes all important. Then we'll get sine of x, I almost forgot that, sine of x equals square root of one minus sine squared x. So all I did was bump that to the other side. But now we've got the radical isolated, so we can square both sides. Whoops. And that will eliminate the radical. So I'm gonna square here, and I'm gonna square here. Now, this is not the way we wanna write this. The way we write this is sine squared x. That's the standard notation for how we write that. Equals, now, this has all, the radicals evaporated, so we just have the innards, the pigs, if you will. Okay, it's looking better, but now there's too much on both sides of the equation. So I'm gonna swim everything on the right back to the left. So I'm gonna subtract one, and I'm gonna add sine squared x. Subtract one and add sine squared x. Okay, this all cancels. And now I have, look, there's a sine squared x and a sine squared x. So that gives me a two sine squared x minus one equals zero. Okay, 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 okay. It's looking better. Let's divide everybody by two to get rid of that coefficient. Sine squared x minus one half equals zero. And this, this, this requires a leap of faith, you guys. We wanna treat this as a difference of two squares. So we can factor it like this. Okay, so we wanna see this as a squared. Okay, well that makes sense. We can do sine of x and sine, whoops, I forgot to write the x, right? Sine squared x, we can see, okay, the root of that would be sine x. That's like the a, if that's the a squared. But how do we make this become a square? Okay, this requires something crazy. Would you agree that four equals the square root of four times the square root of four? right? Because there, there's lots of ways to see this. This is two, this is two, two times two is four. Or you can see this as pigs, right? Four times four, they go together into a single house. And then you can jump out a pair and get the four on the outside. So we want to use this idea with the one half and we want to say that 
1 over the square root of 2 times 1 over the square root of 2 equals 1 half. Isn't that weird? We can use the radical signs to create a perfect square. So this is going to be minus 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1 over the square root of 2, right? Because that's how you factor the difference of two squares. Let me remind you of that. a squared minus b squared equals quantity a plus b times quantity a minus b. Those can be in either order. So that's what I've got here, right? I've looked at this as being an a squared and a b squared, and then I've found the a value and the b value and plug them in here with a plus and a minus sign. Ay, yeah, yeah. So that means that either the sine of x equals positive one half, if I swim that, or the sine of x equals negative one half. Okay, let me take that to the next page. We're finally getting to something that looks like we could actually graph it, right? Sine of x equals one. It's one over square root of two, isn't it? Whoops. Sine of x equals minus one over square root of two. And we recognize this Um, as this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle, right? Because it's one, one square root of two. So sine is opposite over Jason. So it would be a 45 degree. The positives, let me just get my chart here. Right? Sine is positive in the first and second quadrant. So this would be the other and this, if this is 45 and the whole thing is 180, that means this is a 45 degree and a 135 degree, right? But I'm allowed to have negative. Sine is negative in the third and fourth quadrants. So that means these guys are fair game as well. So this would be, so I've got one, two, Three, that would be 180 plus 45, so that would be a 225 degree. And then I can go all the way to here, that would be 270 plus 45, and that's what, 315? Three fifteen. Okay, it looks like those are my values for x, and I have to keep it between zero and under 360, right? But I'm good. This was my condition on the first page. But these are good. But here comes the wrinkle. Just like when we do these kinds of problems, when we, when we get rid of radicals by squaring them, this can create, let me write it. one of my favorite math terms. When we square radicals in order to solve the problem, that sometimes creates what we call spurious roots. <laughs> and what that means, oh, this makes me want to cry. We have to check our answers. All right, so in this kind of problem, because we are squaring the wicked little radicals to make them go away, it can create false problems. So what we have to do is check them. I'll show you how to check one. It's a pain. I will tell you right now that these two work and these two don't. So let's do, let's check uh, 225. And so I'm going back to our original equation. Okay, I don't want to check it in the middle. I want to go back to the original, and that is sine of x minus right. So for this one, we'll try it. 
that would mean that the sine of 225 degrees minus the square root of 1 minus the sine squared of 225 degrees. That should equal zero. I use my calculator. I find out that the sine of 225 equals negative 0 0.707, okay? So that means one minus minus 0 0.707 squared. What in the world, right? So I run this through my calculator. What I would have to do is I would have to take this term, square it, subtract it from one, and then take the square root. If that goes beyond your comfort level with doing it all in one calculation with the calculator, um, you don't want to use the brackets parentheses um, to sort that out. You can do it in steps, right? Like you could square this first and then you could do one minus that, get an answer, then take the square root. You don't have to carry it all in your calculator if that's making you crazy. But what you'll find is that this does not work. Okay? So that's how you check it. You have to go back to the original equation, put in the argument that you're proposing, find that value, and then simplify. And like I said, in this case, the positive values worked, but the negative ones did not, right? It was these two down here that gave us problems. So we do have to check answers for those. Okay, let me show you another example of this kind of problem that does not require so much drama. That was a lot of drama, wasn't it? I thought so. Okay, ready? Solve. Now, this is our usual little caveat, but I noticed something different, and I'm not sure if, I, John probably hasn't started doing this in the homework, but I think he's about to. If he gives you the answer, the, he puts the range limitation on your answer using pi instead of radians, that means he wants you to give your answer in radians instead of degrees. I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. If he gives this in radians instead of in degrees, which it would be zero and 360. If he gives you the radians, then that means he wants the answer in radians. Yikes. But here's the thing. We can work it all the way through in degrees and then just switch it to radians at the end. That's fine. So that's what we'll do. All right. Now what John wants to point out is that here we have a radical sign. Ugh, does that mean we have to isolate it and square it like we did last time and worry about spurious roots and all of that? No, this time is different because last time there was a trig function inside of the radical sign with a variable in it. That's what we had to address. This time we just have a radical sign and we're perfectly fine with that because we know that radicals crop up in our um, trig formula or our trig functions all the time. That's a no big deal. And in fact, we st I start to smell hmm 30 60 90 territory, right? Whenever I see the square root of 3, I think one of those must be inside. So this is a much easier kind of problem. So we can say that the tangent of x could equal the square root of 3 over 1 or and I put that over 1 just so I can see both parts, right? Cuz it's over Arthur and then the sine of x equals minus 1. Oh. Hmm. Okay. So, we want to draw the triangles. All right. So, where would we find, what triangle would we find tangent as the square root of three. Okay, let me just draw 
quickly my 306090. Oh, the, the Algebra 2 kids just learned it today, you guys. 1, 2, square root of 3. So for tangent to be square root of 3 over 1, that's the opposite is the square root of 3. So that means I'm at the 60 degrees, right? So this means x is equal to 60 degrees, right? Because it would be like this. And it would be 1, 2, square root of 3. So when I do opposite over adjacent, that's square root of 3 over 1. Okay, that's good. I want this one to be part of my solution. And then I know tangent is going to be positive in another quadrant. So I reference my chart here. Tangent is also positive in the third quarter. So a 60 degree guy here should also lend me what I want. I double check it just to make sure it would be opposite over adjacent. Okay, yes, that works too. So that would be 180 plus 60. That is what? 240 degrees. Okay, so I'm starting my list here of all the possible values. So I'm going to check and make sure John agrees with me. 60 and 240. Okay, he loves it. Now we want to know what angle of sine gives us a fraction of minus one, and we can assume this is over one. Now, this is a quadrantal value, isn't it? Let me pull that chart out. I happen to have it handy. At what degree measure is the sine equal to minus one? Aha, 270, right? Right there, sine of 270 is minus one. So I want to add 270 to my list. But as long as I'm looking at my chart, I notice something. Tangent, we've got a tangent function in this problem, right? Tangent of 270 is undefined, which means if I try to use this as one of my solutions, that means I'd be putting 270 into this part of the expression too, right? It would go here, but it would also go here. And tangent of 270 is undefined, and that would just blow up the universe. So I cannot use this as a solution because tangent is undefined at 270. Okay, so he cannot be in the club. Does that make sense? Okay, so this problem was easy in terms of the radical, but it was another one where we have to be very careful with our um, with our values that we plug in because we have to worry about the undefined. Notice that tangent is undefined at 90 and 270. So we have to be careful with those two values. Tangent's kind of a weirdo when it comes to that undefined business. Okay, we're almost done. The last thing we have to do is convert our degree measurements. We have to convert degrees to radians. All right, the way that we do that, we know we have 60 degrees. That means we're gonna want degrees on the bottom. There are 180 degrees in pi radians. That becomes three, so it's pi over three. And then our other answer is 240, and we multiply it by the same thing, pi over 180. These both can be, be divided by 60. This would be three this would be four. So our final answer is four pi over three. This is our answer. Our values for x, that's right. Okay, um, you guys, I'm planning to make you that fun little tutorial that will show you how to use a unit circle. The unit circle is gonna help us connect degree measurements to radians and it's going to help you see the relationships between them so we don't have to do this calculation every time. We'll start to memorize them really effortlessly. I'm planning to do that as soon as possible. I was going to do it tonight, but here's what happened. I was 
<laughs> I was recording a lesson for Algebra 2 kids. I got all through it. It's the thing where you have, where you're um, learning to do like this. You have the four equations, right? Something like this. Um, so I went through this whole big elaborate thing. We did two problems where we're learning how to plug this in. And which one do you choose for the base equation? Blah, 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 blah. I finished it. It was a good 20, 30 minutes long. My phone wasn't recording. I had to do the whole thing over again. So I'm not sure if I'm going to get to your unit circle tonight, but if not, it's going to be top priority for me tomorrow. All right. I'll email it to you. Um, I'll email you the link just as I always do. Okay. All right, part B, graphs of log functions. Here's something I want you to remember. This is what we call an exponential function. We're writing a number by expressing it as a base raised to an exponent, okay? Two stands for the log or exponent, n stands for the number. When we write a log function, we're graphing the very same information, but we do it in the opposite order. We start by graphing the number, and then we graph the exponent, right? So it's the same information, just arranged in different ways. And John does a really good job of showing us a picture of that. And I'm going to show you in the book. This is the exponential function. The number equals the base raised to a power. We've graphed these before. We know that um, this place 0, 1 is always kind of the crossing over. We know that this ties down and we know that we can calculate one point. 2, if we choose 2 for the exponent, then 4 will be the number. So that's where we put it and we know it goes up on a big curve. Okay, if we want to take that same information and graph it as a log function rather than an exponential function, everything just gets reversed. We know that if we put in one here, if the, what is the number that we put on two to get the number one. Oh, the log would be zero, right? Because two to the zero power equals one. So there's that same point. Before it was always zero and one, now it's one, zero. The little trailing off tail goes this way, the asymptote, and then the number is the same. If we choose four as the number we want to get, the exponent that we put on two to get four is 2. So there's 4 and 2. This is the same information graphed as an exponent and as a logarithm. That's a cool thing about these two, that the graphs look so similar. Now what John does down here is he shows us the very same information. I'm scooting up just a little bit. He shows us the very same information, but this time he makes the point that mathematicians don't usually use n and l. We use that just to help us clarify. Mathematicians typically use x and y, and they just switch around the meaning. So that's a little bit confusing, because in here, x refers to the exponent. In here, x refers to the number. In here, y refers to the number. In here, y refers to the exponent. So that's a little kooky. And so what I recommend is that if, if you're looking at equations like this and it's confusing you, go ahead and put in the L's and the N's so that you can make sense of it first. This works a lot better. Okay, here is the cool thing though. And I'm going to show you the surprise picture. If you put these two curves, or these two, because it's the very same thing. If you put the exponential curve and the log curve of the same number and exponent on the same graph, look what it does. It, they're symmetrical about the line of y equals x. See, this is y equals x. 
Trying to put that in first. It just goes right down the middle. Then he graphed in the exponent curve, which we've been doing a lot longer, so we're more familiar with. Then he took the very same information and graphed the matching log function, and look at the pattern that it makes. Oh my gosh, that's so cool, isn't it? So it's really fun to do these because we already know how to do these. We can put the dividing line in really easily. And then it's just a question of kind of slipping this one in on the other side. Let's try one and um, you'll see how it works. And this is our last problem for this lesson. Example 65.3. Sketch the graph of the function y equals... Okay, so he's asking us to, to sketch the function of the log, but we're going to do it by, all th by putting in all three pieces, okay? So let's remember what we're looking at here. This is the number that we're looking to create, and this is the exponent that we put on it, okay? Let's rewrite this as an exponential equation, and that would be the number equals the base 3.5 to the L. So I could put this in as the N and this in as the L, like I did last time, like we talked about on the other page. Sometimes the X and Y is super confusing because they switch. Okay, so. One, two, three, four down here in the negatives. We'll crank out a few of these. Remember that the easiest values to choose, we're going to graph the exponential function first, and we will choose um, the exponent we'll choose first is 0. 3.5, here let's give ourselves room to calculate. 3.5 to the 0 power is 1. That's a given. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. We remember this. That goes there. Then if we put a 1 on there, that's 3.5 to the first power, and that's just 3.5. Okay. So 1 leads us to 1, 2, 3.5. Okay. So now we can put our curve in. Beautiful. That's this, right? All right. Now we put in our x, y equals x line, which is going to go right through the middle. And that's not bad. Okay, that's our y equals x. Okay, and now, and we can also call this, um, we can change this back if we want to. We can also call this y equals. 3.5 to the x, right? I can take the n and the l out if I decide that's ugly. They both mean the same, they both relate to the same curve. All right, then this is in just to give us perspective. To graph it as an exponent, we go backwards, right? If we choose, here we go. We're going, to choose, we're going to start by choosing the number, okay? The number we want to choose is 1. If we want to get 1, what exponent do we put on 3.5? Oh, we put a 0, right? If we want to get the number of 0, wait, I did that wrong. Yes, this is what I did wrong. This was fine. If we want to get the number of 3.5, the exponent we put on is 1. So now we graph these points for the second one. 1 and 0. And then 3.5, 1, 2, 3, and a half, and 1. And here, I'll put arrowheads on them because that's always cuter. So this is the curve that John actually wanted us to do, and he called it y equals log 3.5x. That 
is this. Notice that it's perfectly symmetrical, assuming my drawing's perfect, of our exponential curve. And that's why we start with this, put in this, graph these points, and then we can see it all worked out beautifully. Okay, this seems really complicated and hard until you realize that you're just graphing the same in information. They're inverse functions, and so they create this lovely pattern, and it's all beautiful and good. Okay, we'll talk about this. Let me know if you're struggling with those. They seem really complicated, but in the end, hopefully they aren't complicated. Okay, bye.